Okie doke. Uh, we're back with another uh, lecture on vowel acoustics for Ling 341. Uh, I'm doing this because uh, oftentimes um, the first lecture on vowel acoustics doesn't make a whole lot of sense to students, and I'm just going to try to um, approach it from a slightly different angle called source filter theory, um, which also has applications to uh, other segments that we produce in speech besides vowels. Um, yeah, so like I said, with vowel acoustics or acoustic phonetics, it's not easy to wrap your head around um, the first or even the second or the third time you hear about it. And that's why it makes it kind of doubly unfortunate that we're going through this whole um, virus uh, catastrophe at the moment. Um, it's going to be just a little more complicated to um, get across uh, remotely, I think, but at least you'll have the opportunity to kind of review these lecture notes um, at your leisure as many times as you want. So hopefully that'll help out. Uh, but as always, ask questions if things don't make sense, um, because normally they don't make sense the first time around. Hopefully uh, they'll be a little clearer by the time I'm done with this. I don't mean to sound like too much of a pessimist. Uh, we got to stay positive given the way things are in the world. But basically, uh, I'm going to talk about source filter theory today. And normally when I do this, I kind of keep score on the board about what the differences are between the source and the filter in speech. So I'm going to do that with um, a Microsoft Word document here as I go through the PowerPoint notes. Um, okay, so what are we talking about? So source filter theory was developed by a famous Swedish phonetician named Gunnar Font uh, back in 1960. And here's a lovely picture of Mr. Font. Uh, he started out life as an electrical engineer, I believe, and then got interested in phonetics and linguistics and decided to kind of switch uh, fields as he went and applied a lot of lessons he knew from um, electrical engineering to the study of uh, acoustic phonetics. Uh, so his theory was that in speech, you have a source of your sound, which are the complex waves created by the periodic opening and closing of the vocal folds. And I've talked about this in this respect multiple times as we've gone along through these lecture notes. So you're producing a sound down here just by having your vocal folds open and close in the flow of air as they pass, as that flow of air passes through your vocal folds. Uh, and this creates a complex wave which has multiple harmonics. So like I said, I'm gonna keep score with this. So uh, we've got source and we've got filter and I'm gonna give myself a little more space here. And I'm going to bold those. Um, that'll make these bold too, so I'll stop that. And I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger so you can see it. Um, but source, vocal folds. Um, and that's where we're getting sound from. Uh, these are complex waves. So because they're complex, they're gonna have um, more than one harmonic in them. So that this gives you a sense of uh, <clears throat> Uh, what the power spectrum would look like for the source sound that we're producing at the vocal folds themselves. So I'm also going to add to source here harmonics because um, that's where they come from. The harmonics are going to be different uh, for different speakers who ha are using different uh, fundamental frequencies uh, in the uh, sort of rate of vocal fold vibration. So an adult male, this is these are, these are just some example um, power spectra, some idealized power spectra that I grabbed from a textbook. Um, these are giving you samples of an adult male uh, F0, which might be 150 hertz. It's a little bit high, but it's well within the range of an adult male speaker. Uh, so when you produce a complex wave that has a fundamental frequency of 150 hertz, you expect to get harmonics at integer multiples of that fundamental. So at 150 hertz, 300 hertz, 450 hertz, 600, so on and so forth. If we were say looking at a child, they might have um, an F0 of 300 hertz, which is twice that of the um, F0 we see up above here in the power spectrum. So we're gonna see again, evenly spaced harmonics in the power spectrum. They're gonna be evenly spaced by 300 hertz. So the lowest one is 300 hertz, that's the first harmonic. The second is 600 hertz, the third is 900 hertz, so on and so forth. And it's got a note here, this is the fourth harmonic because this F0 is twice as much as this. The same frequency for the adult, adult male is gonna be the eighth harmonic. Um, so you can squeeze in a lot more harmonics when you have a lower fundamental frequency. Uh, with that in mind, I'm gonna put F0 here as a source characteristic of speech, fundamental frequency. Okay. Um, yeah, so just so you know, voicing on its own would sound like a low pitched buzz. So if you're in a sort of weird situation, like maybe in the anatomy lab, for instance, 
that we missed out on because everything got canceled recently. But if you were going to go to the um, cadaver lab over at the hospital and take a look at what uh, the organs of speech look like in real human bodies, um, <laughs> think of a scenario where you just sort of uh, the head had been removed from somebody's um, neck and you could still sort of force air out through their vocal folds to give, produce a sound that way, um, getting voicing without everything on top of it. Uh, it might sound sort of like this. Uh, I turned off the recording of the computer audio, by the way, to try to get rid of that reverb in these recordings. So hopefully you can hear this all right. Yeah, so it's a low pitch buzz. Uh, and the power spectrum looks like this. What I'm playing for you is a sawtooth wave at a uh, frequency of 150 hertz. Uh, so each one of these harmonics is evenly spaced according to the same parameters we saw for the adult male voice on the previous slide. So 150 hertz, 300 hertz, 450, so on and so forth. Uh, they also, um, to form that sawtooth wave pattern in the waveform, you have to uh, reduce the uh, intensity of each harmonic in this sort of nice um, parabolic path uh, as you go up the frequency scale. We're not going to worry about that too much. It's just a fact about math. However, uh, we don't hear this when people speak because their heads are still on top of their bodies, thankfully. Um, and uh, they don't just produce buzzes, they produce something that is filtered by the vocal tract on top of the vocal fold. So I'm gonna go back over to my score sheet and say the vocal tract is part of the sound filter in speech um, compared to the vocal folds. Okay, so what does the vocal tract do? <clears throat> Going back to our definition of formants, so for any particular vocal tract configuration, certain frequencies will resonate, those are the formants, and others will be damped. Uh, so um, I've got a graph here, I'll tell you the analogy here in a second, um, but if you think of how this would work, uh, we're going up and down a frequency scale here, and then on the y-axis it's showing how much of a benefit you get uh, from resonance um, for particular frequencies. So basically this is saying if I play, let's say I have a, a tube of length about 17 and a half centimeters and at the back end I have a loudspeaker producing a sine wave of a thousand hertz, write it here, that sine wave will get no intensity benefit from being played in this tube of this length of 17 and a half centimeters. Uh, so it has zero uh, dB amplitude on this y-axis. But let's say I played a sine wave of 500 hertz in this tube. That would resonate uh, just because of the length of the tube. We walked through uh, the properties of how resonance works. Uh, it just kind of bounces back and forth at the right rate to get that uh, resonant pattern or that standing wave pattern. So if I play a 500 hertz sine wave, then I get um, a boost of about 20 dB intensity to that particular um, original intensity of the sine wave as it's coming out of the loudspeaker. If I play a sine wave of like 700 hertz, I get a medium sized boost like 10 dB. If I play a sine wave of like 300 hertz, I also get the same medium sized boost. This graph just shows me how much of a boost would I get for this length of a tube if I play sine waves of these various frequencies up and down the scale uh, in one end of this um, open tube. Um, you'll see I get these peaks where I predicted them to be um, based on the theory of resonance we walked through before. The peaks are at 500 hertz, 1500 hertz, 2500 hertz, and then we get these valleys in between them, right? At um, 0, 1000, 2000, so on and so forth. These peaks are uh, my formants. Um, so I'm gonna go over to the score sheet and write formants over here uh, next to harmonics. And you can also think of them in terms of F1, F2, F3, so on and so forth, all the way up the scale. Uh, so I've got this analogy here, uh, in case any of you have spent time on a farm or even looked at a farm. I know we live in Alberta, so there's lots of farmland around, uh, but um, you can kind of think of it in terms of natural uh, variation or natural selection. Uh, like I think of it um, when I go back home to the Midwest, uh, you plant like a field of corn at the beginning of a planting season, like in the spring. Uh, and then, at, you know, you can do it automatically in this day and age. So you get like whatever, 160 acres of corn and they're all nice and evenly spread out and planted in rows and columns and so on and so forth throughout your field. Uh, but certain parts of that field will kind of wind up getting better conditions for growing throughout the season. So they might get a little more rain or a little more sunshine or what have you. And they're gonna show, give you corn that's a little bit taller than the corn uh, around it. 
Um, and then other se sections will get bad conditions like too much water or too much dryness or whatever, uh, and they'll have burnt out or just bad corn um, that's a lot shorter. Uh, so that's kind of like this. You can kind of think of it like, well, uh, we're putting our different sine waves into this environment uh, where some of the sine waves are kind of going to grow in intensity, uh, like at these particular sweet spots um, that correspond to the length of the tube, and other spots are going to not fit into those sweet spots, so they're not going to get any benefit, and they're going to look like that um, uh, dumpy corner of the cornfield at the end of the season. Take that for what it's worth. Maybe it helps you, maybe it doesn't. Uh, either way, what happens is that we, when we produce speech, we don't just produce one sine wave at a time and see how it responds in the vocal tract filter. We produce a complex wave that has a series of harmonics evenly spread out um, by the fundamental frequency of that wave. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of them going all the way up the frequency scale. And then they all sort of respond in terms of this vocal tract filter. Uh, so this is our source, what's happening here. The vocal tract filter is going to resonate well for specific harmonics in these sweet spots, these formants um, of the vocal tract filter. And then the output of this whole shebang is going to show us elements of both source and filter properties. So we're going to see the individual harmonics with varying frequency or varying intensities, uh, still evenly spaced in terms of frequency. And then we're also going to see these broader patterns, which um, reflect the response of the vocal tract filter um, going up for the sweet spots that resonate well in the vocal tract filter and then kind of going down for the spots that don't resonate well at all. And the trick is learning how to read sort of both uh, of these features in the um, uh, representations that we're going to see like power spectra and spectrograms. For our purposes, um, when we try to figure out what vowel is we're playing around with, we're mostly going to want to look at um, the properties of the vocal tract filter because um, they make more of a meaningful difference in speech. Uh, so here's an example of what this looks like in real speech. We've seen this before, but it's worth uh, look, taking a look at again. This is me saying schwa. Uh, and this is an F0 of about 160 hertz. So my first harmonics at 160, second at 320, third at 480, 640, 800, all the way up the scale. These are the harmonics. This is these are the results of the um, speech source and my vocal folds. Uh, but these broader patterns, these up and down patterns in intensity, are the result of um, playing that source in an open vocal tract, which resonates well at around 500 hertz, at around 1500 hertz, at around 2500 hertz, so on and so forth. And each of these broader peaks shows you where the formants are. Here's F1, here's F2, here's F3, here's F4. Um, yeah, so the I'll go over here. We haven't talked about voice quality yet, but voice quality. Um, like creaky voice, breathy voice, so on and so forth. That's a source property as well, just different ways of vocal fold vibration, um, different ways to get the vibrate, uh, vocal folds to vibrate. Uh, but if you wanna talk about different vowels, that's a filter property in speech. So when we produce different vowels, what we're doing is shifting around where the formants are. We're shifting, um, we're moving our tongue and other articulators around to uh, get different frequencies of resonance in the vocal tract. Uh, we cover in 441 how that's done in technical detail. For now, you just kind of got to have this sense that um, like a fronter vowel is going to have a higher F2, a lower vowel is going to have a higher F1, so on and so forth, what I talked about in the previous lecture. Um, so for E, we know it has a low F1 and a high F2. That makes it a high front vowel. Um, that you can contrast with uh, sort of the default values of F1 and F2 that we get for schwa, like around 500 hertz for F1, 1500 hertz for F2. F1 is typically lower than that for E, like around 300 or so, so that makes it a high vowel. F2 tends to be higher than 1500 for E, around 2500 in this example, so that gives you a front vowel. Um, this is what it looks like in the power spectrum view. Uh, where you can see the harmonics and you can see the broad shape of the uh, vocal tract filter here. In a spectrogram, what you see is where you get these big peaks in the spectrum. For F1 and F2, you get these dark bars for um, the spectrogram. So F1 is going to be around 300 hertz. That corresponds to this. F2 is about 2500. That corresponds to this bump over here. Okay, so this is not me. This is Bruce Hayes producing the vowel E. 
heed. Uh, but you kind of see that this is F0 of about 185 hertz. Um, this might be a lower F0 here. Yeah, so 150 hertz. So there's a few more harmonics jam-packed into this spectrum than there are in this one. Uh, they're more broadly spaced here. But all that matters to give you a sense of that vowel is that you get some harmonics in that particular frequency region, which are resonating well or being intensified by the vocal track filter. So F1 here is relatively low, again, around 300 or so. Um, 185, 370, so 300 is somewhere in there. Um, I'm not going to walk up the scale, but I'll count 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So this should be about 1850 here. Uh, add about 370 to that, and you get, what, 2220 for the second F2. Uh, so that's still higher than 2220 hertz is still higher than 1500. So this is a front vowel because F2 is high. Um, it doesn't matter which specific harmonic is fitting into this range of frequencies that resonates well, as long as some harmonic is in there, um, giving you a sense that the vowel has that form and frequency. Uh, to give you another sense of how that works, here's schwa at different pitches, and we know that schwa should have an F1 at 500 hertz and an F2 at 1500 hertz. So if I produce schwa with a low F0 of like 100 hertz, I can jam pack a lot of harmonics in here. One, two, three, four, five. The fifth harmonic is gonna be the one that resonates well at 500 hertz, uh, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. If I produce it with uh, F0 of 120 hertz, then I go up the scale slightly differently, 120, 240, 360, 480. So in this case, it's the fourth harmonic, which fits in this peak of the vocal track filter. If I produce it with an F0 of 150, then I have harmonics at 150, 300, 450. So it's this third harmonic, which is gonna fit well into this peak in the vocal track filter. In this one, I've got the fifth harmonic. This one, I've got the fourth harmonic. This one, I have the third harmonic. It doesn't matter which particular harmonic is there, as long as something is resonating well to create that uh, form and frequency in the output. Both source and filter go together in forming the output. The output is what our ears hear. The output is what we interpret to try to figure out what vowel a person is saying. And what matters, again, in terms of figuring out vowel quality is where these big bumps in the spectrum are. Okay, so there's two different ways of looking at, at this in terms of a spectrogram. Uh, there are what we call narrowband spectrograms, which show the harmonics better than the formants. Um, and so this is still me producing this boring schwa vowel. And you can see the harmonics here really well because there's better frequency resolution in the spectrogram. So we got harmonic one, two, three, four, so on and so forth. You can see them getting a little bit darker in some regions of the frequency scale. And that shows you um, what the formants are, but they're not super easy to see, especially compared to the ones that we've done for say that vowel matching exercise for spectrograms. So it's better to take a look at this in terms of what are called wideband spectrograms. This is still the same vowel. And I can no longer see those har uh, horizontal bars very well, which represent the harmonics. In fact, they kind of got wiped away completely. Instead, what I see are these broader gray bars, which represent the formants. And they're effectively where I expect them to be for a schwa. So this first one's at a five, at, the lowest one is at 500 hertz. The second is at 1500. And the third is at 2500. Uh, F1, F2, F3, then there's F4 up here too, but we don't really care about that one too much. Makes sense, this is what we see in a wideband spectrogram. This is what we see in a narrowband spectrogram. Almost always in this class, we're gonna be looking at wideband spectrograms because you can get a lot more information out of them. And if you care, in fact, about sort of the um, sound source features in uh, speech, you can see those to a certain extent in a wideband spectrogram as well, because each one of these vertical bars shows you when the vocal folds pop open and closed. Um, so if these are, and these are spaced in time on the x-axis, so the faster or the higher your F0, the more tightly packed they're gonna be in that dimension. And the lower your F0, the more widely spaced they're gonna be because the longer the period is, the longer it takes you to repeat that pattern. Uh, for the most part, this is kind of a you know expert level spectrogram interpretation to like focus on what's going on with these um, voice bars or glottal pulses. So don't get too distracted by that. For the most part, what we want to see in a wideband spectrogram is where are these gray bars? Where's the center frequency of these guys? Because those are the formants that we care about. 
Okay, um, I'm going to go to a narrow band spectrogram. I'm going to show you what happens uh, when you change the source independently of the filter. So again, remember, I gave you those examples of the different voices like Julia Child and Popeye and so on and so forth, where you kind of get source filter mismatches. But even within any given speaker, uh, you have a definite range of um, source features and filter features that it can, you can add to the signal. So this is me uh, changing my source while trying to read, um, make my filter stay the same. So I'm going to try to produce the vowel ah at the going from the lowest end of my frequency, fundamental frequency range to the highest end. You can imagine what that sounds like before I play it. We'll see if you still laugh by the time we're done. Uh... Yeah, <laughs> so I'll play it one more time. Uh, but this is just showing you how uh, I'm looking at a narrow band spectrogram here. Oh, I forgot to add this to my score sheet, but narrow band spectrograms are better for looking at the source and wide band spectrograms are better for looking at the filter. Um, so I'm going to start off at the low end of my range here, more or less. And like it says at the bottom here, the formats are trying to stay the same, but the harmonics are going to change. Uh, so we can see that better in a narrow band spectrogram. Um, where uh, these harmonics are tightly packed in the frequency scale, I've got a lot here. Um, that means my F0 is low because this is the frequency scale. It's showing you how distant the harmonics are from each other um, in frequency. Um, when F0 is low, they're tightly packed. So like 100, 200, 300, 400 if my F0 is 100. If my F0 becomes 500, it actually goes above that in this case, if my F0 is 500, my first harmonic is at 500, second is at 1,000, third is at 1,500, so on and so forth. And that's more what you see at the end here. They're widely spaced because my F0 gets so high. Uh... Yeah, it's a bit hard to get there. Um, but either way, uh, this shows you how the harmonics change. It's harder to see the formant frequencies. This is supposed to be an ah, so I have a high F1 and a low F2, which are relatively close to each other in the frequency scale. Um, they kind of fade out here because they lose um, some harmonics to work with, but that's the idea. We've seen an example of the opposite of this, where you change the filter independently of the source. So I'll play this again, uh, but this also shows you the harmonics, which are these horizontal lines in the spectrogram. Uh, and this guy is going to change his filter so that he's emphasizing or intensifying different harmonics as he goes up the scale, uh, which is why these dark bars are rising up um, as he goes through the um, production of what he's singing here. Oopsie. <laughs> Um, and when I showed you this example the first time, I asked you to sort of think about what vowels you think um, this stretch of song speech sounds like uh, at different parts of um, the utterance. And at the beginning, maybe it sounds more like an ooh or an o to you because it has kind of a consistently low first formant here. And then this harmonic is representing the second formant. Um, and so F2 is going to be low for a back vowel like O or U. F1 is going to be low for a high vowel like U or E, which is what it sounds like more at the end of this because F2 rises uh, to give you more of that front percept. Uh, I think I also mentioned in the middle here, it kind of sounds like er or something like that. Uh, there's a specific reason why that's the case, but we're not going to get there quite yet. Uh, just stay tuned. I'll talk about it um, when we get to the end of vowel acoustics. Uh, okay, more realistically, um, you can change uh, the shape of your vocal track filter while keeping F0 uh, the same. I'm going to give you one of the answers for the vowel matching exercise here, uh, so don't be too disappointed, but this one is Boyd. Boyd. I'm gonna raise that up a little bit. Boyd. So she's keeping a relatively same F0 throughout there, but the formants change because of the diphthong. Uh, so it starts with something like O, uh, like a low F1, low F2, or maybe a high-ish F1 maybe because it's kind of a low mid vowel. Uh, but F2 is relatively low because O is back. Boyd. 
Uh, and then it goes to something like I, uh, which still has relatively low F1 and relatively high F2. And you can see especially that change in F2 is pretty dramatic. This is what a diphthong looks like in spectrogram form. Uh, and I also have a note here to say, look at the narrow band spectrogram to see that the harmonics don't change. And also show you this way how to go back and forth between one and the other. So this is still Boyd. Boyd. Uh, if I change the spectrogram settings, uh, what I have to do is change what's called the window length. Normally the default is set to 0 0.005. If I change that to 0 0.03 or 30 milliseconds, I see the harmonics better. Boyd. Same thing, uh, but you note here, and they're also kind of consistently evenly spaced apart from each other. I can confirm that by turning on the pitch tracker. This one's a really flat monotone F0 at about 180 hertz. Um, and F2, so one, two, three, four, five. F2 starts out in sort of the fourth and fifth harmonic region. Uh, by the time I get to the end, it's more like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. It's more like the twelfth or thirteenth harmonic. Um, F2 is rising, so different harmonics are getting emphasized, just like the um, throat singer we heard, or overtone singer we heard a second ago. Uh, it's going a lot more quickly, though, um, and you're not able to sort of focus in on just one harmonic at a time. Void. Okay, so the filter is changing, the source is staying the same. Uh, this is my summary. Let's see if I forgot anything. Um, so we've got vocal folds as part of the sound source characteristics. Vocal tract is the filter. Uh, fundamental frequency um, is a property of the source. Formants are a property of the filter, so that corresponds to F0 for source and F1, F2, F3 for the filter. Oh yeah, so standing waves, I didn't mention that. Um, so I've got harmonics versus formants here, but you can also think of standing waves as a property of the vocal tract filter. Um, if you want the pitch of voice, corresponds to F0 and fundamental frequency. In a wideband spectrogram as well, the vertical bars are a property of the sound source, the glottal pulses. And the horizontal gray bars or horizontal dark bands that I've got them listed there are the formants. So those are properties of the filter. Uh, and then I've got this musical analogy of how, um, say, if you're playing a stringed instrument, uh, the strings are what uh, create the sound source in a stringed instrument, and it's the body of, say, a guitar or a violin, which resonates in response to the vibrations of those strings, which kind of amplifies certain frequencies of the sound that give the sound a particular character. Uh, so I could play a string uh, at a particular note, um, like A, concert A, at 440 hertz, but it's going to sound very different if I play it with a guitar or if I play it with a violin, uh, or if I play it with some other stringed instrument, um, in part because of how the body of that instrument resonates. It's sort of like changing the shape of your vocal tract um, as you um, sing the same note. Um, I'm gonna say, uh, there's a lot I could say about musical acoustics, and I do uh, more in 441, I know a lot of students are interested in music, um, and it's fun to think about, but one thing that's kind of amazing about speech is that it has, uh, there's a lot of analogies you can draw between speech acoustics and musical acoustics. Uh, but one thing that we do in speech, number one, um, the spectral characteristics of speech uh, sounds change quite rapidly, like we saw with Boyd, uh, and it changes even more quickly in non-vowel sounds. Uh, but what you do when you speak is that you change the source and the filter independently at the same time in most cases. Uh, it's sort of like if you were to play like um, a violin and you're not only changing uh, your fingering position to produce different notes on the strings, but you're also changing the shape and size of the body of the violin as you go. Uh, it's really complicated to think about how to do that if you're playing the violin. It's something we learn how to do naturally as human beings, uh, something that's way more complex than uh, basically any musical instrument that we play, which is pretty cool. Uh, and with that thought, I think I'm going to stop for now. But again, this stuff is complicated. So if you have questions, let me know.